Hi, my name is Stephanie Trong, and I was diagnosed with cancer when I was 31 years old. And like so many of you out there, or like many of the people you know, I was completely overwhelmed, freaked out, honestly, because I thought, am I gonna die? I think that's a pretty common and human thing to think when you've been diagnosed with cancer. And I was really thankful to learn that there was a standard of care treatment um, in chemotherapy that seemed to have a pretty good um, impact on the cancer in DLPCL. And that's where the problem is. There's a really great need for more options and treatment if that first treatment fails you or fails your loved one. And when the cancer comes back or if it never responded, that's relapsed refractory um, cancer. And that's what we're talking about today is what are the treatments out there? What are the options? What should you know? And that's what today's conversation is about. I'm really excited to be able to bring together conversations with two top DLBCL specialists. And hopefully this will shed some light for you, especially during what is a very difficult time. And so I'd like to introduce our doctors. Dr. Josh Brody leads the Lymphoma Immunotherapy Program at Mount Sinai's Tisch Cancer Institute. Dr. Lorenzo Falchi is an oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center with special research focus on immunotherapies for B-cell non-Hodgkin lymphoma. And what can be critical is how much we as patients and caregivers or care partners know to make sure that we're getting the best care. So that's a great segue into this conversation and I wanna set the stage. So really essentially the standard of care has been our chop as a first line, the first go-to strategy for people an aggressive chemotherapy. But if that doesn't work for the patient, then there's that gap. There's a need of understanding what can we go to. And um, very basically, there's been this big focus on immunotherapy and we've heard lots about CAR T cell therapy and that's been approved in DLBCL. The forward focus right now and what was really exciting at this, this big meeting we're talking about um, is something called bispecific antibodies. And that's really had a lot of progress in research too. We, we were already lucky in lymphoma to have more progress than before. In the last couple of years, I would say the rate of progress has only increased. And the, the unifying theme there uh, of things that are being invented uh, in labs, uh, by companies, in, in academia, uh, if there's a unifying theme, it's immunotherapy, using our patients' immune systems to kill their own cancer. Oh. And you know this sounds a bit... Uh, Back in the day, back 15, 10 years ago, people thought this was a bunch of uh, hocus pocus. Uh, we're gonna use your immune system, use your body to fight this problem. But now it is a real measurable, making people live instead of die thing. Um, and especially the last couple of years, the progress in, in DLBCL immunotherapy has been unprecedented. The most obvious examples are these things called CAR T cells, uh, this science fiction-like immunotherapy that when I describe it to my patients, they say, but that's not a real thing. And I say, yeah, no, no, it's a real thing. And then we describe it, as, it's quite remarkable. And even this somewhat simpler type of immunotherapy that I think will actually have greater impact overall than CAR T cells, uh, which is this class of medicines called bispecific antibodies, another immune therapy that gets your immune cells to kill cancer cells. Okay, so to be clear, the idea of using your own immune cells to kill cancer is an idea that's been around, but really in the last few years is when we're really seeing the impact of this. And so before we dive into this big buzz of bispecifics, um, let's talk about CAR-T for a moment, because as, as um, you know, some people may or may not know, in the CAR-T space, there have been um, three CAR-Ts that have been approved in DLBCL, but they've been approved for third line of treatment. So again, the first treatment didn't work, the second didn't treatment, second treatment didn't work, now we're going to the third one, and Dr. Brody, as you mentioned, CAR-T has been able to put many patients into deep, complete remissions, which is what we're looking for. Um, but, but the last year has shown that CAR-T can be promising even earlier on. Is that right? Some big trials showing remarkable benefit. Uh, uh, CAR-T cells as second-line therapy, not as the first therapy, but as second-line therapy. Uh, and so there they had to show that they were better than the standard in that place. That uh, standard for second line was uh, aggressive chemo and autologous stem cell transplant, which is just very aggressive chemo. And it was focused, just uh, just as you're asking, on the highest risk people. 
only the folks with DLBCL who relapsed within the first 12 months, but that meant a lot of people relapsed in month three, month six. Some of them didn't even relapse at all. They got no response at all from the frontline R-TROP chemotherapy. So on these highest risk patients, the benefit of CAR T cells compared to the old standard was remarkable. Many more of them staying in remission uh, for months now. Now at this meeting, we have a year and a half follow-up of one of those trials here. Many more patients staying in remission. The old numbers with CAR T cells is we thought maybe we were curing 35, 40% of patients just with those CAR T cells. So we'll see if those numbers kind of reproduce or maybe might even be better now using them earlier, using them in the second line setting. So that is for the highest risk group uh, of DLBCL patients that we're talking about. Okay, that's that's really great. And so let's go into bispecific antibodies or bispecifics. Dr. Falke, what is going on with them? Why are people so excited by them and, and how do they work? Well, bispecific antibodies are a real breakthrough class of medications for lymphoma and many hematologic malignancies, that is blood cancers. And uh, what makes them a breakthrough is on the one side, their uh, novel technology, but on the other, the fact that that technology really translated into very impressive clinical results and real benefit for patients. And I like to refer to bispecific as the third big milestone in immunotherapy uh, for lymphoma. The first being uh, monospecific antibodies like rituximab that most people are familiar with in the field, the second being CAR T cell therapy, and I think the third be bispecific antibodies. Bispecific concept, it's actually very similar to the CAR T concept. The CAR T is, is it sounds so fancy, it, it, it's hard to believe. Literally, we take some immune cells out of your blood, uh, takes a few hours, not too big of a deal. We put a new gene in them, a gene that makes those T cells. The gene is called a CAR gene. So you put that CAR into the T cells. Now we call them CAR T cells. But literally, we take the blood out, mail this to some place. It used to be Santa Monica. Now there's a few places. And then they mail it back to you. And then you reinfuse those CAR T cells into the patient. The bispecific antibodies, very similar idea, just maybe a little simpler even. We don't actually have to take the T cells out to make them recognize lymphoma. We put in this thing called a bispecific antibody. Many folks have heard of rituximab, a regular antibody, binds to one protein on one cell. Bispecific antibody binds to two cells. So it binds to your lymphoma cell, binds to your T cell, bring them together. We sometimes say, you know, uh, one of my colleagues said, this is like the lady in the tramp with the spaghetti in between them. And then at the very end of the spaghetti, in this case, is the kiss of death because the T cell kills the cancer cell. Um, and that lady in the tramp image is a pretty good one. I think I have to credit uh, Dr. Matthew Lunning for the lady in the tramp uh, metaphor, but the, that kiss of death, these T cells are highly activated and able to kill that, that immune cell, kills that cancer cell quite effectively. And the punchline is even in folks where the standard therapies didn't work, even where CAR T cells weren't working, it seems like more than a third of patients with these bispecific antibodies are getting complete remissions. Uh, and that's, again, the highest risk group of patients. So if in the worst case scenario, it seems like more than a third of them are getting complete remissions. So we talked about all the promise. We do not want to oversell this. There are also side effects of these medicines. The, the most significant or maybe concerning side effect of all of these bispecifics, really all these immunotherapies, is the risk that we push your immune system too hard and you get a reaction as though you had an infection, but there is no infection. It's just that we push your immune system to react. And one version of that is a side effect we call CRS, cytokine release syndrome. And CRS uh, can be significant, make you get a high fever, uh, make you get low blood pressure. If you get a real bad version of this, you have to be in the hospital for observation and sometimes for treatment of that. So rates and severity of CRS for bispecific antibodies appears to be, at least at this stage, quite substantially different uh, the, compared to what we see with CAR T-cell, particularly Axicel, which is one of the most utilized products for diffuse large B-cell lymphoma. In, 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 that, in those studies, in the CAR T-cell studies, we're looking at double-digit percent of higher-grade CRS. And uh, for, for that reason, most patients, particularly those who are a little bit more advanced age, need to be hospitalized for several days after receiving CAR T cell. For bispecific antibodies, we're looking at a 24 to 48 hour hospitalization. And we're confident that in the future, as we gain more experience, there is a possibility that these drugs, who uh, I would like to remind everyone they're off the shelf products, so immediately accessible, uh, can be given on a fully outpatient basis without having been admitted to the hospital.
And so to be clear, we're not saying that with, you know, bispecifics being so promising and that if they, they are approved that they'll erase the need for CAR T cell therapy. But what we're talking about is there are details that are coming out in this research that will help doctors and patients and, and care partners determine the best treatment path for each individual. Uh, on a logistical uh, basis, CAR T cell therapy is, a, is quite an involved therapy. It needs to be administered by specialized centers. And in the U.S., there's, there's many such centers, but they're, they're not everywhere. So it's important to know where these centers are, who can administer those uh, therapies. Doctors have to be certified. Centers have to be certified. It is not a therapy that everyone can give. Uh, they require hospitalization for the majority of patients. Some patients can receive CAR T-cell therapy on an outpatient basis, but for now, that's, uh, I would say, a minority of patients. Mm -hmm. The majority will require hospitalization and monitoring, and even after discharge, oftentimes patients will be required to stay in the area where CAR T-cell therapy was administered for a period of time. And in the post-CAR T-cell uh, therapy a period, uh, there's you know, periodic monitoring where uh, the doctors will want to look at uh, blood counts and other blood work or, or scans you know, uh, multiple times in the months ensuing CAR T-cell therapy. Uh, as far as bispecific antibodies are concerned, these are drugs that are administered either subcutaneously or intravenously uh, for the most part on an outpatient basis. And this is important because the, uh, although uh, none of these drugs are currently approved by the FDA, it, it is hoped that uh, one or more of them will be approved in the near future because of, their su uh, because of such promising uh, because of such promising results. As single agents, I think what we've seen is that uh, now with longer follow-up for the studies, some of those individuals who had a very good response early on tend to maintain that response. And there is a suggestion that some of these patients may become long-term disease-free. In other words, being alive and well without evidence of disease at a relatively long follow-up time. we all very cautious toward the word cure, but we certainly believe that there is a potential for these people not to have a recurrence. The real future of that is not just how good are they alone, because we never really cured any cancers alone. We didn't cure some DLBCL patients with, you know, with C, we cure them with RCHOP. Combinations is kind of the basis of oncology. So with these easier to use by specifics, the next step is how we can combine them with some standard therapies, and that's already being done. We have some data about that here uh, at the ASH annual meeting. And those response rates are extremely high. So, you know, that is the future. Um, and like we say, it's for now third line patients where everything else has failed, but they are very quickly moving up into the second line. We have some data here at the meeting about second line. And even that we've already started studies, bring them into the first line in combination with the standard therapy. So, I mean, it's a rate of progress. Uh, we're very lucky. Uh, I mean, the luckiest thing would be to have no cancer at all, but you know, if you had to have something, better to have something where the progress is being made this quickly.